The story I have for you today is really an unusual one, and it's not my my brightest or greatest moment in radio, that's for certain. I've just been out of radio for trying to get a job for a little less than a year, and I was you know, doing some things here and there. But I applied for a job trying to restart things. Um, it was early in my career, and I applied for a job in Raton, New Mexico. Now, Raton, New Mexico is, a, I mean, just a little dinky town, a few blocks long, one radio station that served everything. Uh, it was at the top of the Raton Pass where you go from New Mexico into Colorado. So you get a lot of snow in the wintertime, and it was, you know, uh, and it was a lot of rural. I mean, rural. And uh, the, uh, the radio station there serviced not only the local community, but it serviced the, um, uh, the miners who were on the other side of the mountain. Uh, that was the only radio station they could get to was uh, all kinds of mines over there. Not sure exactly. I didn't stay there that long to find out um, what it was. But um, I had short hair. You know, I didn't have long hair. And this was the 70s. And uh, I had uh, applied. And when I got there, the general manager Actually, before he told me on the phone, he showed his daughter, who was, um, you know, probably in her early 20s, uh, and she she worked at the radio station as well. And um, he told her, he showed her a picture of me and said, this is a 19-year-old guy in Los Angeles who's coming to work for us. And she said, no way, the hair's not long enough. Well, I did have hair, long hair at one time, but not that long. So anyway, uh, the, guy, the radio station owner was a guy by the name Jim Roper, and he hired me, and I packed my uh, car and drove up to Raton, New Mexico from Los Angeles, and everybody wished me well, and we didn't know how that was going to work out, but they needed another employee, so, you know, I went up there. And when I got there, I found out that Jim was the general manager, but he also did all the play-by-play. And I was hoping to do that. I had expressed an interest to in that. Uh, and he said, well, I do it all, but you know, we'll talk about it when you get here. I said, okay. Um, when I, we, I got there and I sat down and I said, um, oh, by the way, I'd like if it's okay with you, I'd like to write for the local newspaper. And my last job, I also wrote a sports column to make extra money and just be out there and share, you know, um, with a local newspaper. And um, he said, no. Uh, I don't like them and they don't like me and I want to keep it that way. I said, oh, okay. Um, I listened to the radio station on the way in. And they had block programming. In other words, an hour and a half of country, an hour and a half of middle of the road, an hour and a half of um, something else, an hour and a half of talk, an hour and a half of business, and an hour and a half of um, what he called rock and roll, which really wasn't rock and roll, and then an hour and a half of some other, oh, we played polkas for an hour and a half, because the miners on the other side of the mountain, that was their thing. They wanted to hear polkas. So um, the, he was a general manager. His daughter was the program director. His wife ran the office, and his son uh, did some other stuff. So, um, so he, he, he was going to Washington for the week. And he said that uh, he wanted me to learn the sales aspect of it because my territory, so I was going to have to do sales too, uh, my territory was going to be in uh, the first city on the other side of the mountain in Colorado. And that would be my territory. So he said his daughter would take me over there and we'd, you know, show me around and that kind of thing. And we did. We had a talk while we were over there and, and just, you know, just um, she asked me about L.A. and I was asking her about living in Raton and, and that kind of stuff. And, and she was a pretty confident type person. Uh, um, she was looking at me as her boss, which was fine. I, I was sort of, she was. And so uh, I, I worked on the air a little bit during the week. And then Monday was a holiday. It was Memorial Day. And I was on the air in the morning. And um, he had been gone all week. And I was doing what I was supposed to do. I was literally following the rules. Played a record. And what they did was you played, a, uh, we played vinyl at that time. Uh, played a record. You took that record. And when you were took it off the turntable, you turned it over and flipped it upside down so you knew what you played. And then you could put everything back uh, at the end of the shift. And I played the format. Absolutely played the format. Didn't play anything else. Um, and 
you know, there were certain rules, which I didn't know that he had. And uh, that were, I guess, maybe I violated. But the one big thing was the air sounds. In other words, what we were hearing on the air was going out over the, over the airwaves, was not connected to the headphone jack. Why? I don't know. It, you know, uh, but so technically, if you went off the air, you wouldn't know it. You would because everything else was connected to the air sound. And, you know, just if you're in radio, you, you kind of know those things. You know, you can see the transmitter and the needle that you have to be able to see from the control position. That's the law. If you're sitting in the control position, running the board, what's going on over the air, you have to be able to see the meters uh, showing modulation of the radio station, the sound that's going out over the air. And you, I could see that from where I was. So um, I'd been on the air for four and a half hours, five hours, four hours, whatever. He walks in and he's got this attitude, like, you know, barely says hello. And it's just like, like I'm, I'm dirt, you know? And um, he, he walks in and says, um, you're not given the, the, the call letters at every break. And I said, yeah, I was. I gave him top and bottom and, you know, quarter hours. No, every break in uh, um, format. I want to call, I want to, I want to call her said, I said, oh, didn't know that. Okay, I'll do that. Then he walks into the um, area where the UPI wire was, you know, the wire. And he walks back in and he, with some wire copy in his hand. He said, I don't want this thing going any more than three feet long. And I said, okay, I didn't realize that, you know, but so I, you know, I check it every half hour. It was a holiday, you know, I mean, you know, and you're not reading news on the air. I wasn't reading news. That was somebody else's job who would come in later and work doing news that morning. So when I would check the wire, you know, every 20 minutes or so with no, no problem, that's all I needed to do. And, but I had evidently let the wire paper go for four feet or three and a half feet or whatever it was. And he was just angry about it. Then he accused me of playing my own records, which I did not do. He said, You've been playing your own records. I heard it. I said, no, Jim, I, I haven't. About this time, I had pretty much been fed up with the attitude. And um, he said, no, you've been playing your own records. I, I've been listening. You heard it. We don't have those records. And I said, Jim, Every record I played is right here in the stack. See, just turn them over. That's everything I played. Now, you've been playing your own records. And I said, no, Jim, I haven't. I'm sorry. You misinterpreted what I don't know what you heard, but everything I played belongs to this radio station. And I played it in the format. And he just grunted. And um, about two minutes later, we went off the air. And I turned around to look at the transmitter. And there he was standing there, like, you know, and he said, that's right, mister. That's why we don't wear headsets on the air, because you don't know when we're going, we're, we're off the air. I looked at him and I said, Jim, I, I know the transmitter went off. That's why I turned around. Well, we don't wear headsets on the air. And that's why. And now I'm fed up. And I said, look, maybe you don't wear headsets on the air, but I do. And now he looks at me like I'm defying God. And maybe in his mind I was. Let me tell you something, mister. I own this radio station and you do what I say. And if you don't like it, you can pack your bags and leave. And this is about 15 minutes before I'm going, I'm done with my shift. And somebody else was, I got him, Dan was the next disc jockey. He was in the office. And I pulled my headphone plug out of the jack, took my headphones off, got up and I said, fine. When do I get my check? Right now. And he walked into the office and I followed him in the office and Dan hurriedly came over and took over. I had never before and never since and probably would never do that again. Walk off the air when, you know, in the middle of a shift, just walk off. And I followed him into the office. He got out his checkbook. I was, I'm sorry to hear this because you did some good, good work on all those commercials. I cut 35 commercials during the week. 35. And 
every commercial had his voice on it before that. And that was one of the reasons he wanted me because he wanted me to do, relieve him of doing every single commercial. And we were sold out. I mean, he had everybody in town and that was fun. But, and you know, the radio station was successful and I wasn't trying to change things. I was just trying to do my job. And, and he was just so adamant. And I said, you mind if I come back in and say, do you want to cut an audition tape? And I said, no, I just want to come back in and, you know, dub off some of the commercials that I recorded. Uh, I did the work. I'd like to have them for my for my uh, my um, tape and everything. And he goes, "No, yeah, you can come back in and do it." I said, "Okay." So um, that night, I came back in. I left the next morning. Now, the and, and Dan and I had a good conversation. He goes, "He's crazy. <laughs> He's crazy." And I said, yeah, "I kind of figured that." I said, "How long have you been here?" He said, "About a year." And I said, "Move on as soon as you can because you're not going anywhere here." And uh, we we talked and uh, we had a couple of emails back and, or letters back and forth, I guess, after that. But I lost touch with them after that. But um, Raton was interesting because, it was, like I said, it was small town. I rented an apartment for $45 a month, of which I obviously didn't get my money back. I paid my $45 for the month and, and left. It was basically one room with a kitchen. And then I shared a restroom, a bathroom uh, with another unit uh, between the walls. And we each had a thing where we locked it on our side. It locked both sides. And um, I would, was never going to see him because he was a miner on the other side of the mountain and only came over this side of the mountain every six months. So, he, But he kept the apartment, you know, so he wouldn't have to find an apartment because there were no apartments in town, basically. So but uh, so I, I took off the next morning. I uh, drove around the Southwest, went down to Amarillo, down to Phoenix, looking for a job and, and didn't find one, ended up, uh, back home in California for my next adventure. So that was my, um, one of my not so great moments in, in radio, but we all have them. So that's another story. Uh, thanks for joining me tomorrow. We'll have another, uh, uh story for you and hope that's a little bit more exciting. Thanks.